In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you, we praise you for another beautiful day you have given us. Thank you for the opportunity you have given each one of us to gather together as one family, to hear your voice, to be in the school of the Holy Spirit, to fellowship with one another, and to grow in our journey, in our faith walk with you. Today, Lord, as you teach us, Spirit of God, help us to understand this word. Help us to apply all that we are learning every day of our life. As we face the challenges of life each day, help us to overcome them with the truth of your word. Spirit of God, at this moment, make this teaching absolutely easy, practical, simple to understand. So that as we apply this word with understanding in every moment of our life, we can live the victorious life. We can reach that finishing line that God has ordained for us. We thank you and we praise you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, today our topic is entitled, How to Reach God's Finishing Line how to reach God's finishing line. And you know, brothers and sisters, we, each one of us, without fail, every single person on this world has been put on this planet Earth in order to bear the fruit that God wants us to bear. We must understand that God has put us not just to live on this Earth, maybe for 50 years, 60 years, 70 years, maybe even 100 years. Maybe like Moses, even 120 years. And after that, we should all be finished and gone. And that's the end of us. No, God has put us because he wants to live with us for all eternity. He has created us in his own image and likeness. And therefore, God does not want anyone to be lost. That's what it says in John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that all those who believe in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. And you know, brothers and sisters, although it is God's will for us to be saved, the truth is not many people are going to walk the narrow way. We have seen that in the past. Not many people want to really walk the way of God and reach that finishing line so that we can actually spend time for all eternity with God. And that eternity does not start after we die. It begins right here on earth. We must remember, brothers and sisters, our eternity is not when we physically die from this earth and when everyone says, rest in peace, he's gone to be with the Lord. If we are not with the Lord right now, we are not experiencing that heaven here on earth right now. If we are not experiencing that victorious life with Christ right now, we are only deceiving ourselves that when we die, we will all go to heaven. We will be with the Lord. And that's what happens when people die. Not one person will say anything. They will say, oh, he's gone to be with the Lord. And we don't know whether that person really was with the Lord when he lived on this earth or whether he is going to hopefully think that after he dies, he's suddenly going to be transported in the presence of the Lord. So brothers and sisters, the reason God has put us on this earth is for us to bear the fruit of his kingdom, to experience a life with God here on earth, and eventually to live with him for all eternity so that there we will behold his face, we will be able to see him face to face, and we will be able to enjoy that eternity with God forever. And so brothers and sisters, while we live on this planet earth, God wants us to live a life which is to the abundance. He wants to live a, us to live a life to the fullest. And God's way of allowing us to live is not to live at 25% capacity or 50% or even 80%. God wants us to live a life of abundance. That means a life to the fullest. Everything in God's kingdom, God wants us you know, to enjoy that life which he has promised us. And it is not only when we go to heaven, but right here on earth. And so, brothers and sisters, today's gospel is actually a catalyst for us 
for the talk that I'm going to speak to you today about God's finishing line. What happens in today's gospel? Jesus walks on the water coming to his disciples. He finds his disciples rowing on the sea. There is a storm. They have been rowing for almost about seven, eight hours. A journey which should have taken them about three to four hours because of the wind against them. And Jesus realizes his disciples need help. And he comes walking on the water. And what happens? When Jesus comes walking on the water, the disciples think it is a ghost. They should have expected their master to come to help them because he had just performed the miracle the previous day with five loaves and two fish. He had multiplied that five loaves and two fish and he had fed a huge multitude of people. It says 5,000 men without including the women and children. So we are talking about maybe over 10,000 people with five loaves and two fish. And what happens? When Jesus comes walking on the water to his disciples while they are on the boat, five things happen. The first thing that happens is the disciples are in fear. They think it's a ghost and immediately Jesus opens his mouth and he says, do not be afraid. It is I. Then what happens? When he tells it is I, Peter becomes a little bit bold. He begins to think, how can my master walk on the water? He's not on, the, on a boat. He's walking on the water. So he says to Jesus, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you. Which means Jesus has no other alternative but to say to Peter, come. And Jesus says, come. And Peter, taking that word come, starts walking on the water. Then what happens? He's walking on the water. He's walking towards Jesus. He changes his focus from looking at Jesus to the waves and to those violent winds that are coming against him. Now we must understand, Jesus had told Peter to come to him. Jesus did not call Peter to get out of the boat so that he could get drowned and he could sink on the water. Jesus said come because he wanted to meet Peter in the waters. So Peter immediately changes his focus from Jesus he changes his focus to the waves and to that strong wind. And what happens? Peter begins to sink. And as soon as Peter begins to sink, he cries out to the Lord and says, Lord, save me. Help me. I'm drowning. And Jesus puts a hand out to him and he says to him, you man of little faith. You man of little faith. Now remember, Peter had actually stepped out of the boat. Peter had walked on the water. There was nobody else who had ever walked on the water except for Jesus. Jesus had walked on the water, but Peter takes this word come and he starts walking on the water. But as soon as he changes his focus from Jesus to the waters, to the waves, he begins to sink. And you know, brothers and sisters, this incident reflects our own life on several occasions, including great men and great women of God. Please don't think that all those who actually have become saints, Saint Anthony, Saint Francis Xavier, Saint Augustine, Mother Teresa, all these saints did not actually just become saints. They also went through the storms. They also experienced the same thing that happened to Peter, but eventually, they grew out of those fears. And you know, brothers and sisters, every single person, there is goodness in every single person. And when the word of God is preached, there is a desire in every human being to take the word of God and to start implementing the word of God, start doing the word of God. But what happens when we take the word of God and we start our journey, we are all excited. Have you seen so many people when they go to a retreat? especially when they come to a Bible study, when they come and hear God's word, they see a lot of miracles, they see a lot of healing, they are all excited as they begin with their journey. But what happens along the way? As soon as the journey starts, everybody's excited. You hear a word from the preacher, you hear the word of God, you see a lot of miracles in the retreat, you say, oh my goodness me, that's really the word of God, that's the power of God. And everybody's excited until somewhere on that journey, there is a change in the circumstances. There is a change in the situation. And now 
there is a shipwreck. Now, instead of cruising, we are now in a shipwreck and we are not even able to move forward because we have quit. And now we are operating in the flesh. You know, brothers and sisters, today, let us look at how these challenges come in how we can face these challenges, how we can overcome them and keep our focus on that goal and on that finishing line, which God has given to us. Remember, God wants each one of us on this planet Earth to live a life to the fullest. He wants us to live a life which is victorious. God has not put us on this earth so that we will suffer. We will go through all sorts of trials and difficulties. And then after all the struggles, one day we will die. And then we will think because we struggled so hard, now we will have eternal rest with God. If we are thinking like that, it is a, it is a thinking which is, a, which, is a very, which is a very deceiving thinking because people who think that way are totally deceived. Remember, a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he's going through persecution, even though he's going through a lot of trials, even though he's going through a lot of difficulties, the joy that the person experiences, the peace that the person experiences, the, the victory that the person experiences is beyond what a natural person on this earth experiences. And therefore, brothers and sisters, when we begin a journey of faith, we must focus on God's word. And believe it because when we believe it now we are going to act according to the word of God what is the meaning of believing God's word it simply means I have a message from the Lord I take that message I understand what it says I have a clear understanding of what I need to do based on that message that I've received and as I act on that message now I begin to experience all that that message or that word of God promises me. This will require brothers and sisters every time a response for us from what the word says. For example, let us look at something which is very practical even today. You will be surprised brothers and sisters, absolutely surprised based on the statistics that have been received, you know, which people make statistics, especially if you are a statistician. A person in their lifetime, they will spend a lot of money on their food, especially on their food and their clothing. You know what is the greatest other budget that they spend on? They spend a lot of money going to the doctors, going for medical insurance, spending on medicines, spending on, you know, health care, spending so much in order to preserve themselves. Even if you ask a person who's keeping well, they will spend so much of time going to the beautician, going to the beauty clinics, going to the, going to the dentist or going somewhere which is concerning their bodies in order to give them good health. Every time you will find the budget that people allocate in order to look after their health is so high. Every time, even if they are well, even everything is fine, they will still spend time in going to the doctor in order to have a checkup until the doctor says it is, you are okay. Everything is working fine. And you know, brothers and sisters, if we are going to a doctor, for example, and the doctor gives us a bad report, say he says to us, you got an X, Y, Z sickness in your body. What is going to happen to our mind? What is going to go through inside of us? Every negative emotion, every negative feeling, everything which is negative inside is going to arouse in us. And it, it is at this point, we must quickly change our thinking and focus on God's word because the more we delay in trying to go to God's promise, we are going to arouse within us such negative feelings, such hopelessness within us that this hopelessness is actually going to give us more than physical sickness. It's going to give us mental sickness. It's going to give us depression. It's going to give us, you know, access to the devil in our life. And as a result, that death or that suffering is just going to gallop away like a horse and it's going to lead us into the pit. And what happens, brothers and sisters? If we are not quick in order to take God's promise, if we are not quick in order to seek Jesus and his word, now it is not important to seek God only when we are in trouble. It is important for us to seek God every day, even when the thing, everything is going right in our life. Because the word of God says, there is a moment where things happen suddenly. 
Nothing in our life just tells you that it's going to come. Any problem in our life doesn't come announced. Problems come suddenly. And therefore, brothers and sisters, as we begin to meditate God's word, as we begin to believe God's promise, for example, as I said to you, when we go to the doctor and we receive a negative report, the doctor says you got an XYZ sickness. On the other hand, God's word says in 1 Peter 2, 24, by his stripes, you have been healed. The word of God on one side says you already have been healed. Doctor's report says you have an XYZ sickness. Now, the moment you begin to meditate on what the doctor says, whatever sickness you have been informed now begins, begins to manifest in your body. It starts getting worse by the day. And now you actually begin to experience that suffering, that pain, that discomfort in your body. Whereas on the other hand, the word says you already have been healed. It's past tense. This means I have been healed irrespective of the bad report I received from the doctor. Which means the report of the doctor is a lie. What I'm experiencing in my body is a lie. What I'm feeling in my emotions is a lie. But the truth of God's word is the thing that endures forever. God's word is good, brothers and sisters. God's word does not ever change. And the, and the thing is, when I start meditating on the word, on 1 Peter 2, 24, for example, in my situation of my sickness, and keep speaking the word with thanksgiving continually until my mind is come to rest, then I'm going to experience that presence of God, that peace of God in my mind. So what is my job when I receive a bad report regarding my health? My job is to labor to keep my mind at rest with God's promise, believing the truth, which is not going to change. But my situation, my report, my feeling is subject to change. That is why, brothers and sisters, when we take God's word, which is the truth, when we begin to take on that word, we begin to speak it to ourselves all the time. What we are speaking eventually takes hold of my mind. And now I begin to experience the healing power of God. I begin to experience what Jesus has already done for me in my body. So every moment when I receive that bad report, the word of God says, I'm not supposed to come to God and ask him to heal me because God has already healed me. So if I believe the word of God, I only come to the Lord's presence with thanksgiving. And what do I do? If 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his stripes I have been healed, I need to come in the Lord's presence every moment, especially when those negative thoughts keep bombarding me, open my mouth and say, thank you, Jesus that by your wounds, I am completely healed. Thank you, Jesus, that by your wounds, I'm completely healed. There could be negative thoughts that could be coming to mind. There could be the doctor's report speaking to me. There could be feelings within me. There could be even pain that I'm experiencing in my body. But the moment I open my mouth, I begin to speak the word. I'm not speaking my symptoms. I am not speaking the doctor's report. I am not doing what the symptoms are telling my body to do, but I am doing what the word of God says. And that is, I'm speaking the word with thanksgiving. That's the time I receive the healing in my body. So what happens, brothers and sisters? When the negative thoughts start to bother me, I do not fight thoughts with thoughts. Remember, when you receive a bad report from the doctor, your mind is going to be immediately speaking back to you. Tears are going to roll down your cheek. Is it probably the end of my life? Is this sickness is going to end in death? What is going to happen to my family? What is going to happen to my children? What is going to happen to my job? What is going to happen to my life? Am I going to heaven? Am all the negative thoughts keep coming and the enemy, when you receive bad news, is going to speak to you and torture you with all negative thoughts. But what is our job? When the negative thoughts come, our job is not to fight thoughts with thoughts, but to those thoughts by opening our mouth and speaking God's word. So what do we do? When we receive the negative report from the doctor, I know I'm going to receive those negative thoughts. It is natural. Those negative thoughts are going to speak to me. But when I 
know that I should not fight thoughts with thoughts. I open my mouth and start saying, thank you, Jesus, that by your wounds, I'm completely healed. Thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes, I'm completely healed. Thank you, Jesus, that by your stripes, my XYZ sickness has been completely destroyed. Thank you, Jesus, that I live a long, prosperous, healthy, wealthy whole life. Every promise of God, which is contrary to your situation, you open your mouth and start speaking. And you know, brothers and sisters, the point is, when I start speaking the word of God, listen to this very carefully. This is the real secret because when I went through depression personally myself, I learned the formula through my own personal experience. I went through depression. And when I went through depression, every negative thought came blasting on my mind. It began to say, you're useless. It was better you were not to be born. Every negative, every mistake that I've done in my life, the enemy just kept on magnifying it. The thoughts just kept on pouring, pouring, pouring till finally you reach a stage where you feel it's just unbearable. It's just like terrible. You feel, why was I even born? I'm a, just a useless piece of, I'm a junk, literally. And even thoughts of suicide, things of ending your life come. But the moment you understand that you never fight thoughts with thoughts, but when you open your mouth, so what did I do? I heard a talk which was given saying, when you have, you're driving a car in, in the rain, and when you, when you find the, the, the rain so heavy, you use the wiper of the car. And when you use the wiper of the car, you are not going to stop the car, but in spite of that rain, pouring rain, you increase the speed of your wiper so that your windscreen is clear and you keep moving, you keep moving, you keep moving, even though you may drive very slowly, but in the end, you keep, you keep because that wiper is cleaning your windscreen and allowing you to keep moving to your destination. And what happens, brothers and sisters, eventually, because you are moving, those wipers are moving, you reach your destination, you reach there on time, you get on and do your job. In the same way, when you and I face negative situations in our life, we need to open our mouth, which is just like using the wiper. I do not need to open my mouth and stay paralyzed. When I know that God's word is true, I know that God is faithful to his word. I know that God has finished everything for me on the cross. I need to come in his presence with thanksgiving. I need to come in his presence with gratitude in my heart for what he has already done. So what do I do? When I receive that negative report, instead of just staying at home paralyzed, crying, calling the prayer groups, calling everyone, pray for me. When somebody calls and inquires about me, instead of giving them, you know, a half an hour, one hour talk on what my sickness is about, going to the internet, going to Google, doing research about my sickness, I stop all such activity and I take God's word. I meditate on God's word. I speak the word in, out of my mouth until every thought which is coming contrary to the word of God, I bring it captive. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. If we are not meditating on God's word in order to receive anything from God or our miracle. We are meditating on God's word so that we will keep this mind at rest. Remember, brothers and sisters, when this mind is at rest, this mind is not worrying. This mind is not focusing on the situation, but this mind is absolutely at rest with God's word. When this mind agrees with what is in my spirit, remember, we have already said that a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is one third saved because his spirit has already become brand new. The presence of the Holy Spirit, Christ lives inside the spirit. The day we were born new. That's what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. John 3, 3. 1 John 4, uh, 1 John 4, 17. So all these scriptures tell us that we are already brand new on the inside. We are already having Christ on the inside. Our job is to labor to bring this mind at rest. Our job is to allow no negative thoughts to take care of, the, of this mind of us. And what the mind? The mind is nothing but the soul. And what is the soul? The soul is our thinking, our feeling, our choosing, our emotions, our, our, everything that we do, brothers and sisters, always takes place from the mind. Our mind is our soul. And when the soul is brought to rest, remember 
God has done his part in saving our spirit because God is the one who needs to relate to us in the spirit. That's what it says in John 4, 3, John 4, 23. A true believer, true worshipers worship God in spirit and in truth. But you and I, after we have received Christ and we are made brand new in our spirit, we need to labor to bring this mind to rest. And how do we bring it to rest? By speaking the word, by opening our mouth, meditating on the word, thinking about the word all the time. And when we start thinking about the word all the time, instead of thinking about our problem, we will come to a stage where we'll now have our mind completely at rest. We will have our mind completely in peace. And when that mind is at rest, when the mind is at peace, the healing takes place immediately. And most of the time, people are praying to God to heal them when God says, I've already healed you. So the moment I bring my mind at rest, the moment I let this mind agree with my spirit, that's the time the miracle takes place and healing begins to manifest in my body. That is why St. John, in, in his letters, the third book of John, third letter of John, chap, verse 2, uh, John chapter 3 has got just one, one verse, I mean one, one chapter. In third John chapter, third John verse 2, St. John writes, he says, I wish you begin to have good health as you begin to prosper in your soul, as you begin to prosper in your mind. Let us read that in John, in 3 John verse 2. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health just as it is well with your soul. So John writing in his letter clearly explains that unless our mind is addressed, unless our soul is addressed, unless our soul is prospering, unless our mind is prospering, we will never keep good health. And you will always see brothers and sisters, a person who's always having health issues. If you ever notice, if a person is having some problem with arthritis, some problem here, some pain there, some back pain there, some, you know, some headache here or some arthritis. I tell you, a person who's having health issues, you will invariably see that that person is not at rest in their mind. They are constantly talking about their sickness. They are constantly meditating upon what, what is happening to them. They are constantly complainers and murmurers. They are constantly talking about, about themselves. They become so self-centered that they fail to believe that God has already solved their problem. God has already healed them. And when a person is going through any health issues, when the person opens their mouth and keeps telling the whole world, for example, one of the biggest mistakes that people do when they ask somebody who's not well, how are you? And you know, when generally you ask a person who's having some health issues, you better not ask that person, how are you? Because the response that you're going to get from that person is, you know what? I went to the doctor and the doctor has given me a list of so many medicines. I've got this pain in my body. I've been suffering for the last 15 years and this has happened. And please pray for me. Please tell your prayer group to pray for me. And you get this sort of request coming in from a person who's going through that sickness. And remember brothers and sisters, when we understand God's word, when we understand that Jesus has already healed us on the cross and negative situations come in our, especially concerning our health, which I gave you as an example, we are never going to allow that negative sickness or that negative situation or the negative report to ever take control of our mind. But we are going to speak God's word. We are going to meditate on his word, bring the mind to rest. And the moment the mind is at rest, that sickness absolutely dies from the root the sickness is destroyed and now we walk in divine health so brothers and sisters the formula or the secret to reach the finishing line in walking in divine health is by taking god's word taking his promise meditating on it day and night opening our mouths and speaking that word continually to ourselves and the more we speak that word bring this mind at rest allow our mind to remain at rest we will experience that victory what happens in today's gospel today's sunday's gospel in in matthew chapter 14 
Peter received a word from Jesus. What was that word? When Jesus told him, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter tells Jesus, if it is you, Lord, command me to come walking on the water. And Jesus simply says this one word, come. As soon as Peter hears that one word, come, Peter steps out of the boat. Now, on a natural day, brothers and sisters, Peter would not have ever been able to walk on the water. Peter, even if it was not a stormy day, even if there was, you know, the sea was calm, Peter would never have been able to walk on the water. So when he took that word of Jesus, come, he responded to that word and he started walking on the water. Now what happens? When he started walking on the water, it is to Peter's credit that he got into faith and praise God, he actually started walking on the water towards Jesus. He actually responded to that one word of Jesus come and he along with Jesus became just the two people ever recorded in the scriptures who walked on the water. But hold on, what happens? How long did he walk on the water? As soon as he starts walking on the water, he must have been enjoying it. He probably was, you know, probably, you know, excited. He was in euphoria that he is walking on water. Suddenly, he begins to hear the, the roar of the sea. He begins to see those violent waves coming towards him. And he changes his focus from Jesus and he looks at the waves. And as soon as his focus changes, Peter begins to sing. Peter, who started walking on the water by looking at that word of Jesus, by looking at, by hearing that word come, has now replaced his faith with fear. And now Peter begins to fear. Peter begins to sink in the water. And you know, brothers and sisters, the situation that Peter was facing, the situation that Peter has, had been experiencing was very negative. When he was in the boat, the word of God says that disciples had kept roaring for almost eight, nine hours. In fact, if you look at the map and see the distance between that lake, a normal journey when on a still day without any problem would have taken them three to four hours. So they were roaring against the wind and they must have been physically tired. And to make matters worse, they had not even completed half the journey. And here is Jesus who comes on the water, says the word come to Peter and he starts walking on the water. So the situation was terrible. When Peter stepped out of that boat with that word come, the situation was still bad. The sea was roaring, the winds were against him, but Peter took that word come, and even though the situation was negative, started walking on the water. He was in faith when he started his journey, but what happened? As soon as he changed his focus from Jesus to the sea, to the roaring of the, boat, of the, of the waves, he now went into fear and quickly he started sinking. And you know, brothers and sisters, the same thing happens even today. Do you think that Jesus changed his word? Jesus had simply told Peter, come. He never told Peter, Peter, you just come two steps forward and then we shall see what, what is next to be done. Jesus simply said to Peter, come, which meant that Peter Jesus expected Peter come right up to Jesus, meet him, hug him, you know, embrace him, or probably even fellowship with him in, on the, in the middle of the sea. So brothers and sisters, there was no change in Jesus' word. There was no change even in the situation because even the waves were still violent, the sea was still roaring. So what was the change? What happened? The change took place in Peter's thinking. Peter changed his thinking from faith to fear and immediately started sinking. Even when Peter stepped out of the boat and started walking on the water, the wind was very strong. It was very, very terrible. So the situation was not conducive for Peter to walk even when the, when the boat was still or when the, when the sea was still. Imagine, uh, brothers and sisters, say there was no storm and Jesus had come walking on the water. Peter, even otherwise on a still day, would not have been able to walk on the water because nobody can walk on water, only you can walk on land. So there was no difference whether it was a stormy day or whether it was a still day. But yet, this same Peter started his journey in faith. He started his journey with that one word of Jesus come. And now 
as soon as he changed his focus, he began to sink. You know, brothers and sisters, this brings us to a very important truth in our faith, in our faith journey. We could start in faith, but even if our journey is violent while we are beginning, or even if the journey at the start is calm, we need to keep our focus on God's word. Because we may start our journey, you know, with not such a violent storm. We may just probably start our journey because there could be some motivation based on what we have heard about God's word to keep us on that journey. But as we begin to hear the news, as we begin to get bad news, as our situation starts getting worse, are we ready to stand by the word of God? Are we ready to keep that promise of God's word? Are we ready not to quit so that we will reach the finishing line? Brothers and sisters, while we start our faith journey, it's a fact that many a times we will be distracted. We will be disturbed. We will even be discouraged on our journey. But the word of God says we are not supposed to quit. We are not supposed to give up. We are not supposed to give up halfway because Jesus never wants his people to give up their fight of faith. Jesus did not tell us to start our journey with faith and then come halfway and get drowned. God wants us to reach that finishing line. What did Jesus say to Peter? He said to Peter, you of little faith, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You know, brothers and sisters, Peter had faith. He walked because of his faith. And when he changed his focus from faith and his focus went from Jesus to the storm, his faith became zero and his fear came back to him. There is a time in our life when we hear God's word. There is a time when we go to a retreat. There is a time when we come to a Bible study like this, that we are all excited with God's word. We may even note down, we may we even make a result that from today, I'm going to study God's word. I'm going to operate according to God's word. But when we start our journey, that journey of faith begins very excitedly it becomes very, you know, we are very excited. We have become very exuberant. We are really, you know, full of uh, gusto in that faith journey. But as soon as that journey starts, there are going to be challenges on the way. There are going to be, you know, moments of discouragement. There are going to be moments where people are going to come against us. There are moments where the devil is going to use people against us. There is going to be persecution. There is going to be so many negative things coming against us. And at such times, brothers and sisters, knowing that Jesus has already told us that there are going to be storms. Our faith is going to be tested. Every person who has got faith and starts his journey of faith is going to experience a test of faith on their journey of faith. And at that very moment, we are called to bring this mind at rest. Remember, brothers and sisters, the situation may not change. Our circumstances may not change. Our thoughts are the ones that need to remain constant because the moment we change our thinking from the word to the situation, that's the moment we are going to sink. That's the moment we are going to lose that battle. That's the moment we are not going to reach the finishing line. And that is why the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 6 to 10 gives us a, a, you know, a recipe. He gives us a formula. He gives us a direction. He gives us the, the understanding of how we need to keep our minds at rest. How we need to keep this mind constantly on God's word. How we need to labor to keep this mind at rest, our souls at rest, so that when those challenges come, we will never allow our circumstances, our situation, the bad reports that we face, the negative comments of people, the persecution that we will face on the way to distract us to reach our finishing line. Let us read Hebrews chapter 4, verse 6 to 10. Since therefore it remains open for some to enter because of for some to enter it. And those who formerly received the good news fail to enter because of disobedience. Again, he sets a certain day, today, 
saying through David much later in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not speak later about another day. So then, a Sabbath rest remains for the people of God. For those who enter God's rest also cease from their labors as God did from his. So dear brothers and sisters, the writer of Hebrews is saying that it is not a day, it is not an event, but it is every single moment that we need to keep our minds at rest. Today in the new covenant, there is no such thing called as a Sabbath day. There is no such thing as, you know, a, a day where you keep aside for resting. Because if you are a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to keep your mind at rest 24-7. And you know, brothers and sisters, we can go on a Sunday to church. We can go to a Eucharistic celebration. We can go to a prayer meeting. We can go to a retreat on one particular day or even three days or five days. What happens after the retreat? What happens when we get out of the church? What happens when we go to our homes? What happens when we go to our workplaces? What happens when we are out in, on, on the highway of life? This is the moment we need to experience those challenges and we need to understand that we need to labor to keep our minds at rest. You know, in the old covenant, people believed to go on a Sabbath day. They believed to spend one time with the Lord. But the moment they came out, they lived their lives as though they never even belonged to the church. They never even belonged to Christ. They never even had a God because their God was only inside the four walls of the church. It was just a ritual. It was just a custom. It was still a tradition. And whatever they did inside the four walls of the church was only as far as they and God was concerned. But what they learned from there was never translated when they came outside the church, when they came outside to their life, when they came to their families. And brothers and sisters, when we understand that laboring to keep our minds at rest is no excuse for any believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, when we understand that we need to labor to keep our minds at rest 24 seven, every moment of our life, we need to labor to keep our minds at rest, not allowing the negativity of this life, not allowing the situations of this life. So brothers and sisters, the challenge is not to receive victory, but to labor to keep our mind, our soul at rest along the way and victory shall be assured as long as we do not quit. Because when we quit on the way, we are not going to experience. Many a times people just keep praying praying with hope, hoping that they will receive something from the Lord. And the word of God says in the book of James, a person who's double-minded will receive nothing from the Lord. I could pray with hope, hoping that something will happen because I, didn't, I don't even know what God has done. But the moment I know God's word, I know his promise that he has already finished it, my attitude is always going to be an attitude of thanksgiving. I'm going to Come in God's presence with thanksgiving, with gratitude, knowing that it is already finished and I'm going to enjoy eventually that victory because I have allowed my mind to remain at rest. I've allowed this soul of mine to remain at rest. I've allowed these thoughts of mine to remain under control and not to go crazy. Because remember, brothers and sisters, if this mind is not at rest, what is going to come out of my mouth? is only going to come out everything which is negative. And the word of God says in Proverbs 18, 21, life and death is in the power of my tongue and those who love it shall eat its fruit. So when I open my mouth and speak things which are contrary to God's word, when I speak my situation, I am actually bringing death into my life. And slowly but surely, that those words that I'm speaking are going to actually land me into big trouble and eventually destroy my life. But the moment I keep thinking on God's word, the moment I begin to meditate on God's word, what is going to come out of my mouth? Words of gratitude, words of thanksgiving, words with gratitude according to his word. And those words that I'm speaking are actually bringing me closer to my victory. Now let us look at some examples of how I actually start in my faith journey 
and finally end up absolutely broken, absolutely disappointed, not reaching God's finishing line. Let us take the first example of marriage. You know, brothers and sisters, when, when a man and a woman get together, they are courting, even though it may be an arranged marriage, even though they may have been put together by somebody else. There is always that excitement. I'm going to live with somebody else. There are flowers, there are chocolates, there are, there's everything good. There's all a the honeymoon going on. And eventually as time passes by, the word of God says, when two people are joined together in a Christian marriage, they are not just two people, they become one. The word of God says in Mark chapter 10 verse nine, that what God has joined together, no man shall divide. That's what God's word says. It was mentioned in the book of Genesis. And again, Mark in his gospel also mentioned in Mark chapter 10 verse 9. He says, what God has joined together, no man shall divide. So what has God joined together? He has joined the husband and the wife together. And they are no longer two, but one. Now what happens? As our journey of marriage begins, as we begin to live as husband and wife, there could be issues coming up. Maybe the husband, you know, becomes very irritating. He becomes a very different person. The wife becomes a bit of cranky or becomes, you know, uh, you know, a complaining person. There are health issues. There are financial issues. There are issues between the spouse. There are in-laws issues. There are outlaws issues. All sorts of issues come up in a marriage. And at that time, what will our focus be? Are we going to make each other? other the time it is because of you that i'm suffering it is because of you i'm suffering in my marriage it is because of you this is what is happening you know brothers and sisters when we keep our focus on god's word when we keep our focus on what that promise was at the beginning of our marriage because the word of god says that what god has joined together no man shall divide and if we take that promise in the midst of our crisis, in the midst of our situation, in the midst of everything negative happening in our life, and we open our mouth and meditate on this word in Mark chapter 10 verse 9 and say, Thank you, Lord, that you have joined my husband and me together and you have made us one flesh. You are our covenant partner. Lord, in this marriage, even though things are not going right, not the way we were expected at the beginning, Lord, I know that you are our covenant partner. This is not a marriage between my husband and me. This is a marriage between three people, my husband, myself, and you present with, at that, that day when we made that covenant with you. And brothers and sisters, as we begin to open our mouth and start speaking the word, start saying, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you have joined my husband and together. Thank you, Lord, that you have my wife and me together. You hold your hands and continue to pray with the Lord. Continue thanking him. Start saying, thank you, Lord, that for joining me and my husband together. Thank you, Lord, that, you know, we are blessed. Our marriage is blessed. Our family is blessed. Our marriage is blessed. Now, as you begin to meditate on God's word with thanksgiving, brothers and sisters, that word that you are meditating on, that promise which you are speaking out of your mouth with thanksgiving brings in the presence of Jesus into your situation and your problems become so small. They actually begin to shrink. They begin to get so insignificant that now, brothers and sisters, your marriage gets right on track. Your marriage gets fixed. And now you begin to experience that life in your marriage, which God has ordained right from the day he was involved in your marriage. But most of the time, what happens when we experience challenges in our marriage, we keep God aside. We focus on our situation. We meditate on our problems. We begin to tell everybody there is the whole town who knows that there's a problem in our marriage. And what happens? The more we begin to meditate, on the problem the more we begin to ask how it's done what our med what our our, our in-laws have done what the family has done what the finances are going on instead of we sitting together and asking the lord to, to intervene we destroy our own marriage literally in hell and we are not able to reach the fishing line for that marriage which god has ordained for us let us take another example of finances you know brothers and sisters the word of God says in Philippians 4 19, it says, God supplies all our needs according to his unlimited riches in glory by Christ Jesus. You must understand the day you believed in Christ, you have access 
to the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, there is no drought, there is no famine, there is no lack. The moment you become a true believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have access to that place where God has everything provided for you and for me. But what happens, brothers and sisters? Along the way, we have job loss. We have financial constraints. There is a pandemic right now that has come in. We have certain financial obligations. We have our love offerings. We have to give charity to the poor. There are so many things that we want to do. We have to pay the fees of our children, rent. There are so many issues that come up in our life. And when these issues come, we forget what God's word says. We forget and we allow our circumstances to become so huge before this great God that in front of this great God, we have magnified our problem to such an extent that God looks so small and our problems look so huge. Remember, brothers and sisters, when our situation of finances comes, for example, which I'm talking about right now, we need in the midst of our situation which we are facing in that financial problem, we need to open our mouth and say, Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you provide me more than enough to meet all my needs according to your unlimited riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, brothers and sisters, as you open your mouth, speak that word continually. Bring your mind at rest. Do not allow those, those situations to get so big in your mind. Now, as you meditate and bring this mind at rest, it allows God to intervene in your situation and bring a solution to your problem. You know, brothers and sisters, most of the time, people have understood that when they pray, God will come there and will provide money in their bank accounts. Somebody will come in their way and bail them out of that situation. It can happen, brothers and sisters. But the true way of receiving our miracle is first and foremost, not focusing on our situation, but allowing God's word continuously by meditating on it and bringing our mind at rest and the moment our mind is at rest and we have allowed what we are meditating on to agree with our born again spirit that's the time god intervenes supernaturally people come into our life remember god is not going to put money in your account but he's going to send people into your life who are going to be a blessing to you who are going to get you out of that financial situation let us take one last example an example for a couple who are looking for children there are so many couples today i receive you know requests especially you know during this class brother can you please pray we have been married for 10 years we have been married for 15 years we are looking for the gift of a child we have not received any children can you please pray that something good will happen i always tell them do you know that do you really believe in the lord jesus christ yes yes we pray we are praying for so many years i said hold on what is the promise on which you are holding on? What is that promise that you are believing in on? So the word of God says in Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Let us first, before we go to Romans chapter 4 verse 17, let us read Exodus chapter 23 verse 26. Let us read Exodus chapter 23 verse 26. No one shall miscarry or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days so no one shall have a miscarriage or be barren in the land he's talking about this promise in exodus which is in the old covenant brothers and sisters we belong to the new covenant where jesus has already redeemed us from the curse of the law he became a curse that means the blessings of abraham upon us not only upon us but upon our generations so if in the old covenant, God had promised the people of Israel that there'll be no miscarriages, that there will be no one who will be barren in the land, how much more in the new covenant? That's an Old Testament promise. Let's come to the New Testament. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Another promise for us to understand how even though we may be childless for so long, we can take that promise of God and receive what the Lord wants to give us. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. He calls into existence things that do not exist. 
He calls into existence the things that do not exist. You have not seen that child. You only want to have that child. You can call things into existence as though they are. Remember, brothers and sisters, if he is saying that he made Abraham the father of many nations, when you belong to Jesus, Galatians 3.29 says, the blessings of Abraham are upon you because you belong to Jesus. That's what it says, Galatians 3.29. In Galatians 3.29, because we belong to Jesus, the blessings of Abraham come upon each one of us. And what are the blessings of Abraham? The blessing of a long, prosperous, healthy, wealthy whole life, not only upon you, but upon your whole generation. Let us read Galatians 3.29. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring. Heirs. You are heirs according to the promise. Abraham is the father of faith. If you belong to Jesus, then you are a child of Abraham. You belong to all, you get all the blessings of Abraham. Did the blessings of Abraham stop with Abraham? No, they went to Isaac. From Isaac, they went to Jacob. They went to the 12 tribes of Israel. In the same way, brothers and sisters, when we belong to Jesus, we believe in his word. We believe that we are blessed. That not only we are blessed, but our generations are blessed. Just between a husband and wife, that, that generation is not going to end, but it's going to go on. Generations of that marriage are going to be blessed. When we begin to meditate on God's word, Instead of looking at our circumstances and saying, Lord, I'm barren. It's been so many years. I'm not, I'm married. I don't have any children. We can open our mouth and say, thank you, Lord, that your word says that there will be no more miscarriages in my womb. My womb is blessed and my life is blessed and my, I, and there is no more barrenness in my life and I and my spouse and our generations are blessed. As you begin to open your mouth and begin to speak that word, combining Exodus 23, 20, uh, 26 and Romans 4, 17, every day keep speaking that word. Instead of looking at your circumstances, people will come and ask you, how many years you're married? How many children do you have? And you open your mouth and you say, you know, we have been married, but we are just going to have a child very soon. You speak your faith. But instead of speaking everything negative as per your circumstances, you can actually cancel your miracle by speaking your facts. And brothers and sisters, in order for each one of us to reach the finishing line of God's word, to reach that finishing line that God has given us, we need to take God's word. Every situation that comes to discourage us, that comes to make us quit, we keep the smile and rest. We keep focusing on God's word. We keep speaking his promises. We speak it day and meditating on it. We will eventually see what God has promised us manifest in our life and give us that victory and take us to that finishing line that God has promised you and me. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for giving us the understanding of your word. You have put us on this earth to live a life to the fullest, to live a life of abundance, and not only for ourselves, but our generations. To Lord, we refuse to let our situation, our circumstances, our problems, our reports take hold of us because they are so small when we compare them with you, our great and mighty God. When we meditate on your word and allow your word to bring our mind at rest, Allow this mind to agree with what is already in our spirit. We receive everything that you promise and help us and allows us to reach that finishing line that you have given us of victory. For this understanding, for this great joy that you've given us of knowing the truth of your word, we thank you and we praise you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.